Hi, welcome to module seven of lecture one. It's the last module in part one of lecture one, and it sort of ends our discussion of theory building and theories and the scientific method in general. We're going to end here by noting, sort of reiterating some stuff we said before in a more concrete fashion, and then discussing threats to what we're trying to do here. So first, let's begin by reiterating that models are incomplete simplifications of reality. Our models are often very simple. They might be bivariate, so containing only two variables. So they might connect, say, the opinion of an electorate in a district with the votes of a representative in a legislature of that district, very directly. In reality, though, we know that's not the whole story. The district opinion might matter, true, but so might the stance of the party of the representative, so might the representative's personal preferences. We also know these things might, might matter interactively. It might be the case that the preferences of a representative, in, in terms of, for instance, how much that representative cares about being reelected, might affect the degree to which that representative cares about the district opinion. People, politicians who are less interested in being reelected, might care less about the district opinion than politicians who are, care more about being reelected. So we have these multivariate, um, more than one variable interactions, um, influences. We have interactive effects. These are all complications that make our theories less simple, that make the reality less simple than our theories might, might indicate. Now we can theorize on about all that stuff and model more completely in this exact fashion. However, there's always going to be more complication beyond what is specified in our theories, and that's okay. Our goal is not to explain the world fully. Our goal is to create a useful simplification of an aspect of the world we are trying to understand better. And as long as that understanding is not you know, completely um, eliminated when you add more complexity to it, as long as it holds up somewhat in the introduction of more complexity, it is a useful simplification to make. So as long as we can sort of highlight a particular causal interaction in a simplification of the real world in our, in our theoretical model, we have produced a useful model. Second here is models are probabilistic. What that meant, to, re to reiterate from before, is we have independent variables x that are causally prior to, to dependent variable y, and changes in them cause changes in the dependent variable. So for instance, coming from the literature on um, sort of mass violence, as frustration with, say, the government increases, that's the independent variable, the dependent variable, individual aggression also increases. These are just examples. The fact that our models are probabilistic has strong consequences, though. X may increase or decrease the probability of Y occurring, right? So changes in X lead to changes in Y. But we can't just directly claim that X causes Y just based on observation. We could if these are all deterministic, right? If X always changed Y in the exact same way, we could just say, upon observing how X changed Y, we now know how X affects Y, because it's going to happen the same way every single time. For probabilistic things, that's not the case. Right? Think about just flipping a coin. If I flip, if I flip a, a coin and it comes up heads, right? I can't then say, oh, flipping this coin produces heads, because it's false. If I flip this coin four or five times, I'll very likely get a tail at least once, falsifying my earlier claim. So in general, we can't just look at a probabilistic thing once and understand how it works. All we're going to see is average behavior. On average, does increasing x increase y? And our goal will be to try to use these average behaviors we identify to um, re uh, eliminate rival explanations to our theory and provide support for our theory that x causes or, um, or contributes to y. So we infer that this relationship exists by reducing and eliminating rival explanations like the null hypothesis. Um, and that's really important. I gotta, and I want to just pause for a moment to note that that's probably the most important thing in this course in a way. And that's the thing that most people have real trouble understanding without lots of training, is that when you have a probabilistic behavior, a single event that's contrary to my claim does not invalidate our theories. 
see this all the time, for instance, in climate science. People all the time say things like, oh, well, it was really cold this summer, or it's really cold this winter, and therefore it can't be true that the climate is warming. And that's just false, factually speaking. The fact is that any event like the climate that has a probabilistic component with some element of randomness, you can't determine whether or not the underlying theory is true, that the underlying relationship is, is true or false, by observing a single point, in da a single data point, a single point in time or space. Rather, we're looking at effects over time on average. It might be that in a single year, 80 days of the year are colder than the average. But if consistently the overwhelming majority of the days are warmer than average, and this is a pattern that happens year after year, we say the climate is warming, even if every single day doesn't satisfy that rule. That's the same thing for, for all social sciences. We are not going to say in general that we know exactly what happens to everyone in every time period in every situation. Rather, we want to say on average, if the district opinion is more favorable to a certain policy, representatives might more often vote for that policy. Not all representatives would do that. There'd be variation across representatives and context and time. But on average, if we want that claim, if we want to make that claim, we're trying to see that that claim um, is, has support or not. On average not for every given case. A single example that supports our case doesn't prove it, and a single example that, that's against our case doesn't disprove it. Um, so that's important, and that's key to remember out of all this. Because of that, inference has primacy. All we're gonna do ever is infer cause relationships, never observe them directly, never prove them directly. We're gonna try to employ good research design to overcome threats to our inference to make it easier to get support for our theoretical claims. So I'm gonna conclude now by talking briefly about what these threats of inference might be. Most examples you've seen so far are direct effects. Some X causes some Y directly. But lots of stuff that happens in the world are in, happens indirectly. When you started this video today, you pushed a button in some fashion on whatever device you were using, and the device itself did something to start the video rolling, and then the, you started watching the video, which is the why, the outcome. While it is true that causally, your pushing of that button caused the video to play, right? there was an actual causal relationship here, it was indirect. It was mediated by the existence of the device you're using to watch the video on. That's usually okay, but we might, want, we might care about how these mediations happen because it might be the case that there'd be situations in which Z wasn't present and your action wouldn't lead to Y. So for instance, if I just push a button in the air, videos don't start playing, right? That seems incredibly foolish, but it's the truth, right? The, my action of pushing a button doesn't by itself cause videos to play. <laughs> Only in unison with the device that acts as the Z does the video play, and that's important. Um, more threatening in a way are spurious relationships in which X and Y seem connected, but there's actually some third Z that causes both of them. The example I like is a, cheesy, is, a, is a kind of cheesy one, which is that ice cream consumption and um, violence might be correlated. You might ask, how can that be? That's, that seems weird, right? Why is, why is that the case? Is it that ice cream headaches are just so bad, right? You, you know, you know you, that you must go out and, and commit violence because you have them so much? Obviously, that's, that's, that's not true. <laughs> um, rather, a third thing in this case Increased temperatures cause people to consume more ice cream, but also to commit more violence. And that's dangerous for our, our causal inference because now the Rx and Ry, even though they occur together, are not in any way, shape, or form causally related. It's actually this third thing, this Z, that causes both. So we have to be really careful for, the, for this kind of spur of this relationship. And finally, um, we might have relationships that are more complex than simple increases or decreases. So a linear relationship on the right here is one in which the change is constant over time. As x changes, y changes in the same way every time. And it doesn't matter what the value of x is, y just changes uniformly. On the left, it's curvilinear, and the, actual the rate in which y changes with x changes as x changes. That's important because it, it affects how you measure these things. If all my data are from here to here, I see a strong and positive relationship. If I have all my data, I might see a kind of weaker positive relationship. 
if my data only start from here, I might see a strong negative relationship. Right? So it's a complex relationship that you actually have to model explicitly. And if you're just um, naively saying x related to y, and you have this kind of curve linear relationship, you're missing something. And you might end up um, making incorrect causal assumptions. Now we can deal with that too, um, and we'll see how to do that later. But that's important also to keep in mind. So we're going to talk about, in general, four hurdles to cause that come up primarily in inferring causation, leaving aside the curvilinear linear one. Um, first, a credible causal mechanism connecting x to y must happen. Um, you can't have a theory with no causal relationship. Second, we have to ask ourselves, could the reverse causation be happening? Could y cause x instead? Could x and y be related not because x causes y, but because y causes x? Third, does x and y co-vary? Do we have actual co-variation? Is there a correlation between x and y? Do they happen together? And finally, um, does some third variable, z, influence the values of both x and y? Do we have spurious causation? Okay. So we'll deal with those in turn. First, a non-causal theory. As we said before, right? a non-causal theory does not explain how and why x moves or changes y. So we can't assess causality at all. The theory must make it possible for x to cause y, which means the change in x we see in a theory must precede any observed change in y. We can't have a situation in which x happens later, but somehow explains the earlier action of y. We don't have time travel here. Um, so the solution is to provide a theory that explains how and why changes in x tend to produce later changes in the value of y. The second one is endogeneity, right? It's called a reverse causation. If we're trying to understand how x causes change in y, changes in y, we don't want y to cause changes in x, right? So if x contributes to a change in y, we should not also have y causing changes in x, because that 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 makes it more difficult to assess whether or not x does cause changes in y. It might be just that y is causing changes in x, and that's why they're connected. That's why they're correlated. So for example, states with more interest groups, the x, tend to have more citizens' initiatives. The theory there would be that the states with the interest groups are able to produce more initiatives. However, it's also the case that the states with more initiatives foster the formation of additional interest groups to sponsor countermeasures. So it is not just that increasing the number of interest groups increases initiatives, which it might, but it's also there's feedback. And now the number of initiatives leads to more interest groups. And that makes assessing causality more complex. The thing we spend more time on in this class is just simple covariation, right? If x causes y, it must be the case that y changes when x changes. If not, x can't cause y. So correlation or covariation between x and y is necessary, but not sufficient for inferring causation. It's necessary for the simple logic that you can't have y caused by x if when x changes, nothing happens to y. But it's not sufficient because there might be other spurious causation or other threats to causation that make this correlation not indicative of underlying causation. And finally, um, returning to spurious causation, we might see that x does co-vary with y, that x and y are correlated, but we've missed the true causal mechanism connecting x to y. There might be some other variable z that's not considered that's actually affecting both x and y. This is tricky because we can't control for all possible intervening variables, right? There's an infinite number of possible things that could matter in theory, and we can't control for all of them. What we're going to do instead, and learn how to do in this course instead, is attempt to control for as many competing theoretically relevant explanations for the de dependent variable as possible. So for example, in the 60s, there's a correlation observed between higher coffee consumption and a higher probability of developing lung cancer. And this is a good example, going back to a, a few slides ago, about how this is probabilistic. This was not a correlation that said every time you drank more coffee, you got lung cancer. This is probabilistic. More coffee consumption, on average, was associated with a higher chance of developing lung cancer. Now that leads to the question, is this causal? Does coffee cause lung cancer? That's an important, given how much everyone drinks coffee, right? That's an important thing to know. However, it turns out that that correlation was spurious. Coffee drinkers tended to smoke more often in the 60s, and smokers were more likely to develop lung cancer. 
So smoking was actually correlated with both coffee drinking and lung cancer, and that was causing a spurious causation between coffee and lung cancer. So what we're going to learn how to do in this course is control for the more theoretically relevant alternative explanations that might be leading to spurious causation, like, for instance, smoking in this case. Um, so that was it. Um, the next module starts with part two of lecture one slides. Thank you very much.